Hello and welcome. I am Gaurav and you are watching Eureka. Sitaron se aage jahan aur bhi hain, abhi ishq ke imtihan aur bhi hain. Desire is yet to be put on test. There are spaces and worlds beyond the star which are yet to be explored. The journey of human beings to explore spaces started when USSR, Soviet Union, put a satellite in the space, followed by a dog going there and then Yuri Gagarin. We in India were slightly late entrant, but we have covered a long distance from the cycle era to the modern era when we are going to touch Mars. And today we have a special guest with us, Dr. Radha Krishnan. Welcome to our show. Thank you. It's great to have you at Eureka. Thank you. You have grown with ISRO. You have seen the period when a lot of discussion took place whether India should invest in space research or not. To a position where the entire world recognizes our expertise in space. How has been this journey? See, we started uh, in 1962 with the Indian space program in a modest way. The questions came, why a country like India should invest in space at all? And that answer was obvious. There were people dying, there was hunger, there was unemployment, there was so many problems because British left us completely drained. And at that time, some of the scientists along with political leadership take a decision to invest in this area. Obviously, they were just... Indian space program is unique as compared to the other countries who got into it. We wanted to look at the issues that are facing this country, the problems of common man and society, how space could be made use of for this purpose. And that's why Indian program is unique. It is application centric. It is people centric. And self-reliance has been one important element of this program. It was not only for exploring these spaces. It was not only the science, scientific curiosity that was the prime mover of this program. It was the people of India and science was to be used, space science was to be used right from the beginning for a common exactly. purpose. That has been the focus and even today that is a focus. When we develop the capability in the launch vehicles, in the area of satellites and when we even look at an exploration of moon or Mars, our fundamental issue is how do we make use of this technology for the benefit of the society, the people for the development planning in this country for good governance. See, in the initial phases, when we were in nascent stage and we didn't know really the technology and we were trying to develop technology on cycle and bullock cart and using all those things, has the culture of doing science and doing technology changed over a period of time as you have seen? See, it's a long journey of nearly You came to, uh, uh, let me, let me yeah, cut it yeah. here a little bit uh, and go back in the memory lane. You joined as an electrical engineer, as a young person, ISRO at that time. And an electrical engineer getting into space was a unique thing at that time. Electrical engineers did not get into space programs. And here you get into that and develop expertise and use your expertise and develop that expertise over a period of time to achieve the heights. How has been this journey? This journey is unique. See, for ISRO, it's a journey of five decades. In the 60s, we started with the program. We wanted to, in fact, do some scientific experiments in the ionosphere using sounding rockets. But then we got into an era where Development of satellites for communication, development of satellites for remote sensing or observing the earth, developing launch vehicle capability, this became the agenda. My entry into the space program was in 1971 when the SLV-3 program was just being planned at Thiruvananthapuram. And if you look at the disciplines 
you require almost all domains of experience if you have to handle space. And when you talk about space application, even the biological sciences are finding a place there. So right. electrical engineer has a lot to do in the area of space, technology, control, guidance, instrumentation, avionics. That was the area in which I got into it. But that apart, India in the early 70s decided that we will build a satellite. Aryabhata came up in the year 1975. Right. We will get into launch vehicle technology. The SLV-3 was to put a satellite into an orbit using our technology. We did that by the end of that decade. And if you look at the applications, we started using the foreign satellites and got into the experiments for television, for telephony, for remote sensing applications. So that is a phase in which we were in the experimental phase. But if you look at the 80s, we got into the operational phase. We got the operational INSAT system. We got the operational IRS satellite system. And we also got into the PSLV developments that we are seeing with so many successes in the country and a precursor for our GSLV. So all this happened in that period. So we have been part and parcel of that process. See, let me uh, pose a question which generally kids have asked me. We have SLV. PSLV, GSLV, it doesn't make sense to a common person. What is the difference between the two? And how excellence is achieved from one stage to another stage to another stage. And without crossing the first stage, you cannot reach the top. That is what science is all about. So what are these stages? See, we started with a rocket that we used to use for the scientific experiments. It goes like a projectile. Right. But when you talk about a satellite launch vehicle, it has to put a, an object, the satellite, into an orbit. That means it has to give a desired velocity for that purpose. So SLV-3 was our first step in putting an object into the orbit. But an object into the orbit. But we wanted to put it into the desired orbit. That was the next step. The augmented satellite launch vehicle where we introduced the closed loop guidance system and you decide at this altitude, this velocity has to be provided so that that satellite will get into this particular orbit, we could decide that. And the satellite launch vehicle could do that job, that was ASLV. It was a precursor for the PSLV development. When you talk about PSLV development, it was originally meant for putting the remote sensing satellites into a polar sun synchronous orbit. That is the reason it is called P. But that is a rocket. Okay. It can do several jobs. If you put the right software into it, the mission software, and you design the mission, it can launch a communication satellite, it can launch a satellite for scientific applications. But it's a powerful vehicle which has three variants. But when you talk about the GSLV, it is a more powerful vehicle. When PSLV can put a satellite of 1.3 ton into a geostationary transfer orbit. GSLV 1.3 tons. 3 tons. Now GSLV can put 2.2 tons. That is the enhancement in increasing the Increasing even 1 kg is a technological challenge yes. at those speeds and those orbits and those distances. Yes. So when we go to GSLV, what is the difference? There are two differences. To achieve this higher capacity and that too in a cost-effective manner, we have to use propulsion systems like cryogenic stage that is a more efficient way of putting that satellite of that capacity into the orbit that is much bigger mass. The cryogenic technology provides higher specific impulse that is for a given mass flow rate of the propellant you get a higher thrust. So if you look at the GSLV, 50% of the velocity for that satellite is provided by this cryogenic upper stage. That's the, the last most important stage part. of firing. Yes. You can put a, an object into a geostationary transfer orbit using PSLV, but at 1.3 class 11. That's all. And if you see the lift of mass of PSLV, it's about 320 tons. Which to put this 1.3 turn into the geostationary transfer orbit. Whereas for GSLV, it is nearly 425 ton, which can put 2.2 ton into that place. So that is more efficient. We'll come back to that. Don't go anywhere. We have to take a break. We'll come back soon.
welcome back dr radha krishnan it's been just fascinating for probably every indian and it's always been a pride mo- moment of pride when success is achieved one after the other by isro now we are in a stage from where we had started we have seen a lot of ups and downs during this period there was a period of isolation and today we are in a situation where we have collaboration with 20 countries and we have collaboration with almost 160 countries in the ocean exploration area so today are we genuinely part of the international human gathering of those scientists and technologists which are into this exploration or are we still feeling areas of uh, isolation if you look at the position of india globally in space i should say we are one among the first six and we have been there for and everybody sub- recognizes and that and several position. years if i may quote two studies one is done by an organization called futron and i have seen the results right from 2007 we are one among the six and this is done based on a comparative evaluation of 15 space faring groups in the world on 50 metrics qualitative and quantitative there are also studies which are more quantitative in the nature but in all these areas we are there in the first six if you look at the space application specifically india is considered the role model for the whole world for the very simple reason our focus always has been on space application application and we ensure man. that we reach the last mile and the person or the agencies who are involved in the management of natural resources or disasters or communication infrastructure they make use of this technology the other aspect of launch vehicle if you look at our pslv which has done 27 launches as of now 26 have been success we With are launched, very high success rate we have launched 40 satellites of other countries of this 40 i should say two major satellites of france we launched one very recently spot 7 spot 6 in 2012 we launched also for several other countries major satellites they were dedicated missions for launching foreign satellites we have also built two communication satellites on a commercial basis for european customers that shows the level of technology that we have and the level of confidence that others have exactly right from 1995 indian remote sensing satellite data has been used by other countries in us in europe and other parts of the world and during the last 4 5 years one of our instruments in the ocean sat 2 was being used by nasa nova and umetsat for their regular forecasting of wave height in the ocean so this talks about the technological benchmarking If you look at Chandrayaan one mission, that was a great success in 2008, 2009 period. We were there with instruments of other countries and instruments of India, and we could achieve that mission. And currently, we are into the Mars Orbiter mission. We are through with 92 percent of the right. journey, and we are waiting for the next 25 days to say yes. This is where we are. The the, the question would be. Uh, that as it happens in many areas of science that when you know the technology when you know the language of science when you know the language of technology then others start talking to you at par with and that is when the real transfer of knowledge takes place between cultures various cultures so you are saying that we are at a stage today where we can learn from others but we also have something to teach i can also add the following way if you take the last two years we had two satellites built jointly by isro and the french space agency that we flew one was megatropics other one was saral satellite and currently with nasa we are working for building a satellite jointly which could be launched by the year 2019 20 one of the things that have been asked uh, repeatedly by lay people is that how do you plan for 50 years 
you are not going to be there, I am not going to be there. But the program has to be thought for next 50 years and 100 years. Because each launch has a long gestation period. At the end of the launch, you have to think in terms of what is going to be the next, which is again going to be a long term thing. How do you do it? And how do you keep the if, track of it? If you look at the visionaries who did the space program in the 60s and what was the direction in which they took the organization? What was the direction in which they took the people in the organization capable of planning for a future? And the systems and processes put in place to ensure this. That will tell us a lot. That is how ISRO has been able to do that. So it is the vision of scientific leadership of that time. People like Sarabhai, people like Omi Jahangir, Baba and SS Bhatnagar, they could visualize 50 years in advance. Number one. Number two, they also could nurture people, groom them into a process in which they can look at the future. And when you talk about a program for the next 50 years, it's a direction. Of course, long gestation period is involved in the space, so you have to plan well in advance. And you cannot have knee-jerk reactions. You have to so you have direction. to have trained manpower, train the younger generation continuously, consistently, painstakingly, and also think in terms of technological advances that are going to be there. Yes. And that's how you have to keep track of the whole record. And the direction is very clear actually in our case, space applications and self-reliance. Space application and self-reliance. I have to take a break. Don't go anywhere. We'll come back soon. Welcome back, Dr. Radhakrishnan. It's been fascinating discussing space program with you. Uh, one has lots of questions in mind, but the time may not permit all the questions to be answered. Let me put uh, questions of general interest to public. We have reached a state where now we are talking really with another planet today. The first stages have been complete success. In fact, more than 100% efficiency if you efficacy of the entire program up till now. What is going to happen on 24th? First and on foremost, 24th. the whole nation is with us and the whole world is watching. Next 25 days, the following things are going to happen. On 24th of September, at 7.15 a.m., we should be able to start the liquid engine in the Mars Orbiter spacecraft to reduce its velocity and take that spacecraft into an orbit around Mars. If we don't reduce the velocity, it will shoot and will not get into also, that orbit. We need to ensure that on that day when the spacecraft is in the vicinity of Mars, it is at nearly six to seven hundred kilometers after a long journey of 680 million kilometers and in this long journey which is a technological marvel. it has gone through the influences of sun and all other planets and our ability to estimate and say yes we are on course. of each one of them. yes and say we are on course to reach that level this has been another major and our accuracy if i say so our accuracy has been on the dot because we did not have to fire corrective uh, measures. We did two. In fact, on December 1st, when we first put the spacecraft towards Mars through a trans-Mars injection, we were able to do that precisely. In another four days, it got, in, got out of the sphere of influence of Earth. And on 14th of December, we had the first correction operation. And Recently, in June, we had the second correction. We did not do what we originally thought we would require in April. In August also, we thought we will be requiring one. We are not doing that. Now, we will see in the next... Which means we have saved fuel. We have saved a few grams of fuel in that operation. But yeah. more important that we know that our navigation of the spacecraft is as planned. It is on course. This is first and foremost. So, next 24 days, we will watch whether we require any further correction. 
one most important thing which i want to mention at that time today the satellite is nearly 200 million kilometers away from the earth the radio distance itself while it has traveled over an hour something like mm -hmm. there is a difference between real distance and radio distance yes the real distance is 200 million kilometers line to line but the spacecraft is not moved in a line to line manner it goes into a heliocentric arc which is very long total distance to be covered is 680 million kilometers approximately we have covered almost 92 percent of that when this 200 million kilometer distance comes you have a signal delay of nearly 11 minutes we have covered 92% of the distance. Yes. Can we say that we are 92% successful? No. <laughs> if the spacecraft... That is what is expected of scientists. And I use the word spacecraft and satellite right. interchangeably. Can orbit around Mars. We would say 85% of the mark we can earn. The remaining part of it is for using the scientific instruments therein for making observations about Mars. Which is the final objective of the entire mission? The primary objective is orbiting. The secondary objective is to make measurements during the life of the spacecraft. Once it goes into the orbit of, of Mars, what are the steps that you are going to take uh, one by one in order to achieve yeah. the mission? You, you uh, talked about the action on September 24th. So at 7.15, if we initiate the firing of the engine and we are able to do that reduction of the velocity i should say by about 8 15 am on that day we will know that yes it has done its job or not mm -hmm. and by about one o'clock on that day we will be able to estimate the parameters of the orbit that means how far it is from the mars Activity. Exact parameters you are talking about exactly. because generally you know the band is from 600 to 700. Uh, if you are able to reduce the velocity as we intend, which is controlled by a system on board, yes, we have to achieve that, but we need to measure that from the ground stations. We make observations and then construct that ellipse. There are five instruments, and the systems of the satellite also need to be checked. That's the first and foremost. But on the first day, we are expecting that we should be able to operate the Mars color camera and a picture of Mars we should be able to get on that day. Of the course, the nation is going to celebrate that picture anyway. But while doing these uh, operations at almost neck breaking speed and also at such far off distances, how much redundancy is built in, in the whole system? There are two parts of it. One is the redundancy. If something goes wrong, how is correct? Yes, one is redundancy, redundancy built into the spacecraft itself. Number two, the autonomy built into the spacecraft for activating those redundancies on itself. We cannot have the ground controller detecting something is wrong and then send a command. The whole process may Suppose there is fever. Up. Yes, <laughs> to eat or nausea, yeah. then it should so be the, able to take a pill. Yeah, so the spacecraft itself has the autonomy provided to take such action, detect the health of a system and then go to the standby system. So that is available there. And we Which is done through very powerful computer built in? In the satellite. In the satellite. Second one what happens is all possible contingencies during this process we anticipate and we get ready for it. So this is another success factor. Look at all possible contingencies and be ready to face them on the ground. So there is control from here which is simulating what can happen or could happen in the spacecraft yes. and there is also redundancy built and control built into yes. the spacecraft yes. Yes. which should be able to take corrective measures based on contingencies. Yes. Something happens there, it should immediately yeah. act. How much time uh, we have taken uh, to, to, to build the entire thing and what is the uh, expenditure? See, August uh, 2010, we started the feasibility study. In June 2011, we were 
clear that we can have a mission in the next possible opportunity and this opportunity comes only once in almost two years. So we wanted to avail the first opportunity. August 15, 2012, Honorable Prime Minister announced this mission. On November 2013, 5th of November 2013, we had the launch and today we are closer to the final destination. destination. Has any country done this exercise in such a short time? To our knowledge, this is the first time and you asked about the cost of making it. The spacecraft, the launch, plus the ground station support required for the entire mission, all put together, it is rupees 450 crores, so almost 70 million US dollar. A Baba's ashram has more money than this. If you look at the international missions, I would say this is nearly one tenth of what. Yeah. USA has put in recently for the Maven mission. It's a rough comparison. It's been just wonderful and very tense for me to choose between various questions that should be asked. It's been just wonderful to be here. And I think that on your behalf, I can promise the viewers that you'll be ready to answer questions if they send it on our email, which is Eureka RSTV at gmail.com. I think that we'll be troubling you till 24th again and again and again. For now, I'll take your leave. You. It's been real pleasure to have you at Eureka. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll be back once again with as fascinating a personality as Dr. Radhakrishnan is. It's difficult to find one, but we'll come back. Thank you for watching. Eureka.